I'm Lornek Mekcioğlu and I'm a solutions architect with AWS. I work with the global financial services customers um, and prior to this my entire work life was spent in financial services and I learned a lot and I enjoyed that you know quite a lot. Uh, I was in infrastructure engineering teams and I started in web infrastructure, centralized authentication systems, moved into a few other areas and then at the end I found myself with cloud native deployments at scale, specifically multi-region deployments with CICD and Terraform. And um, it was a lot of blood, sweat, and tears to come up with a solution uh, to this topic. There are not many end-to-end -end examples that are available out there. So it's a bit of a mystery how to come up with um, an approach, and that's why I wanted to share this approach with you today. And um, with that, I'm gonna get started. So that slide that looks awful is, uh, <laughs> Basically, what, what I'm trying to show is that there are 27 regions today around the world um, for AWS, and inside each region there are two or more availability zones. And availability zones just mean that they contain at least one or more data centers inside of them. So typically, uh, when you're deploying in a single region, you are spending your work workloads across multiple availability zones, and when you do that, you're gaining enough redundancy and resiliency in a single region deployment. And typically, you know, that is where you get started as a first step. But then why would you ever need multi-region deployments? So that will be your business users, in my experience. They'll come to you and they'll be demanding certain requirements that will require multi-region deployments. Uh, one of that is, hey, how do we recover from disasters in another region? And that could be, in fact, be mandated through external regulators or internal auditors on these business users. Another reason could be satisfying data residency requirements. So, for example, in EU, with GDPR, you know, we need to keep the data where it's originating from. So we bring our workloads closer to that data, and therefore we have to deploy our workloads in multiple regions. And yet another reason is just bringing our workloads, bringing our compute closer to our globally distributed end users. So all that is, you know, nice, but then, you know, what happens? How do we go about multi-region deployments? And um, what we find is that managing those multi-region resources, they can be quite complex. And um, so we have an account here and it has two region deployments. It has Singapore and Sydney. And um, so how do we create these resources to begin with, to be consistent? And then how do we ensure that they are consistent throughout the resource lifetime? So through updates and deletes over, you know, course of months, how do we ensure consistency? That becomes a challenge. So that gets me thinking, how do we build and deploy consistently at scale? And recently my house is a war zone because, you know, it's going through renovations, renovating bathrooms, and that got me thinking, how do we build and deploy consistently at scale when it comes to just buildings? Uh, and here in the picture, we are seeing um, a row of apartment buildings that look similar to each other. So when I think of architects, they are using technical drawings to be able to, you know, produce the same replica of the building over and over again. Similarly here, we're going to be using blueprints. And blueprints are not a new concept, they're 180 years old. And they were initially created here in England and the very first application was by Anna Atkins. So she was a botanist and she created the blueprints of algae, seaweed. And that was the very first world's um, photo illustrated book. And the photos in this book were blueprints. So we use blueprints everywhere. We use them to build a house, we use them for landscape design, we use them for web design, but we also use them for core infrastructure deployments at scale. And we're gonna be using Blueprints today using Terraform for the core infrastructure. And in addition, another concept is the idea of building in layers. So when we're building a building, uh, we're not just like, you know, plump, like making one big, you know, construction, we actually have to first 
you know, dig a hole in the ground, pour the concrete, set up the exterior structure, and then we move into the interiors of, of the building. So then we'll maybe create the living room and the bathroom and the kitchen. And those rooms, interior rooms, they have a different update cycle. So they have a different release cadence than the exterior of the house. If you think about it, the foundation of the house, we don't touch as much, while the bathrooms, apparently, we renovate every 10 years. Um, so basically, what I'm trying to say is the rooms, the interior rooms, are more like the applications, the workloads, and they each live in a different Git repo. You may have different business units, like risk and research, and they have application developers aligned to them and they'll have their own release cadence. While the foundation, the core infrastructure, typically in my experience, this is you know, maintained by DevOps engineers or SREs. So that is what I'll be using in my sample today. And another idea is about the pipeline. So when we're building multiple replicas of the same object over and over again, how do we ensure that we are maintaining a level of quality standard? such that that end product it doesn't have any defective parts. So for that, we're going to be using an assembly line in this side, you know, that is kind of similar to an assembly line or a pipeline in this case, where we apply a uniform set of procedures to maintain level of quality, level of security for our deployments. So that's what we do. We combine these two ideas together, and we have our deployment workflow. That is four steps. Everything today is four steps, so it's easy to remember. And um, yeah, so first of all, we have our blueprint in a Git compatible repository. And we have our DevOps engineer, and DevOps engineer is working inside the central tooling account. And DevOps engineer is going to use their favorite source control branching methodology. And for the sample, I had to pick something, so I picked trunk based development. They're going to Git tag to release from trunk. And the Git tags here are opinionated. So they have meaning in terms of the target for the deployments. So if you look at the convention that we are following here, first we have an environment type, like dev, QA, staging, prod. Then we have the deployment scope, like a region or global resources for global resource deployment. Then we have the team name or the business unit name. So if the Git tag is dev EU central one research and a version number, then what that's informing the pipeline is that we are going to be targeting research dev account and EU central one region for the core infra deployments. So upon Git tag creation, the pipeline will get triggered. And then the core infra is going to be de get deployed into the target account according to the blueprint. And the stages, we also have four of those. So we always have a source stage, of course, in every pipeline. So that is a version S3 bucket that contains all the Terraform art artifacts. So it contains the blueprint that contains core infra definition. And it also contains the Git tag that is the target for our deployment. We will lint the code using tflint in this case, that is such that we get you know, warnings around um, code quality you know, to detect any illegal resource types and to detect any deprecated syntax or unused declarations. This is how we keep the quality control of the code in check. Then we perform a security scan using Chekhov. That's another open source tool. Um, and Chekhov is going to be helping us to detect any open doors that we left open unintentionally. And uh, those open doors could be, in this case, S3 buckets that are publicly accessible, but we didn't mean to do that. Security groups that are open to the world, we didn't mean to open them to the world. Um, maybe load balancers that we didn't protect with a web application firewall, for example. And finally, we will be building, and for build, no surprise here, we'll be planning and applying the Terraform from the pipeline. So I had demos, which I won't be able to get to, but there are demos of this available. Um, there's a blog post available. Also, all of the code is an open source GitHub repository. So um, first of all, couple of considerations about this uh, solution is that when it comes to deployments at scale, we want to follow multi-account strategy. And that, you know, an analogy for that is basically when I arrived to London, I took a plane and the plane has multiple compartments, multiple cabins. 
and you know I had an economy class ticket, so therefore I, I had access to that part of the plane. You know, there were business class users, and then first class, and then finally there's the pilot of the plane, he has access to the restricted part of the plane, which I would love to get into, but I can't, uh, and that's the cockpit. And the cockpit has all of the flight controls to fly the plane. So similarly, DevOps engineers are those pilots, for um, deploying core infrastructure at scale to these accounts. So they're the ones entitled with access to the CI-CD resources. So what we're going to do is we're going to use the account as a boundary to isolate those CI-CD resources. So account for that is the central tooling account. And for our business users, for example, we may have a research business or a risk business, and those businesses each have their own purpose which may be different. So research business could be publishing investor advice to external users, and that advice could be deemed you know, confidential perhaps, while risk business is going to be performing audit advisory to the internal uh, users of the company or internal business units. So we're also going to put those uh, workloads for the different business units in different target workload accounts. So one idea about um, pipelines is typically we start with putting our pipelines in, a, in one region and we target different you know, regions from that pipeline. But what if we actually went ahead and deployed our pipeline into another region? And we can do this in the solution because everything here is deployed with Terraform, including the pipeline resources. And when we do this, one idea is to make sure we use the region as that boundary. So what we'll do is region one's pipeline is in charge of region one's deployments, region two pipeline is in charge of region two's deployments and so forth. So if there's any issues with region one's pipeline resources, that means region two through N deployments can continue without any interruptions. And this was about basically catching those open doors early so we wanna shift security left in SDLC. Um, if you want to ensure that we can repeat that same deployment over and over again at any point in the future, uh, one approach is to ensure you can only have one entity who is in charge of that. So for that, you know, basically we're saying make the pipeline the authoritative source for deployments. And what that means is you want to lock down the access through other means to the users. So if you have you know, console access, for example, the user shouldn't be able to make changes through the console, through the API, through the SDK, or any other entity for that matter. It should be just the pipeline that can make those kind of changes. That's how we can achieve repeatability in deployments. This is about the backend config, um, and here also there's isolation per environment. So if you have Terraform state files that you want to lock down in dev, uh, in prod environment, for example, then you know you may want to basically the approach here is to separate where you're storing those files um, per environment type, and uh, also separating per environment and per region the Terraform state uh, files. And what that gains us is if there's any glitches in you know one region, then the the other regional deployments for that account doesn't you know, have any issues, is not affected. And also if you're expanding the deployments to additional regions, then the existing regional deployment state files are not affected. This is the final uh, architecture diagram. Everything inside the pink boxes are deployed with Terraform. Things on the left have to do with the CI CD and they have to be there. It's like a chicken and egg problem. You have to create them first, but I'm using Terraform to create them as well. Well, once the pipeline is up, then I'm able to use the pipeline and then target the different accounts and regions uh, for the deployments. Um, so if, if you want repeatability in the deployments, it's important to make the pipeline that golden source of truth for deployments. If you want consistency in our multi-region deployments, again, it's important to think about how we structure the Terraform code, because there are, there's code that is regional scope, there's code that's global scope, so we need to think about that. And just closing the open doors that you didn't mean to leave open, we want to shift security left for that. So that's the blog post and sample code. There was a session survey, and thank you. That's it.
Any questions? <laughs> um, what mechanism would you use to switch to the passive deployment? So if you added an issue in the one region, how would you move your traffic or your requests over to the second one? So, um, so you're thinking about um, shifting traffic over? Yeah, so like if, like if you were using the second region for DR, Mm -hmm. It's a sort of a passive region. What would, how would you make sure everything moved across to your? The, yeah, there are a few different approaches there. Um, you know, um, Route 53 provides some of that capability. There's also Global Accelerator that provides that capability, depending on the type of applications that you have. Um, you know, you could prefer one or the other. Within Route 53 space, there's also a new like feature that that helps with you know that type of. Um, switch over yeah there's okay. a couple of mechanisms thank you thank you yeah. any other questions just a quick one does more is multi-region storage less or better for sustainability so um i'm going to say that that's a bit out of uh, my research for this topic so if you like we can take that offline and okay. discuss it further yeah I will, yeah i'm open to do that yeah any other questions i had a question why is everybody using terraform <laughs> what else is there to use right now is it to me yeah uh, i know that cdk is big um, yeah, if you're a developer, I think CDK makes it easier. You don't have to learn something new. Whatever language you know, you know, like Python, etc. You can uh, use that. Um, yeah. 